you find your seat, grab your hymn book, turn to hymn number 281 this evening. Second. Praise the Lord. We like to just have a little fun. Amen. We can have fun in church. It's okay. Amen. And we, we like to do that. And we like to have just, it's about praising God, right? It's not about trying to be all goofy and everything, although sometimes we're a little goofy around here. But that's all right. We can have fun in the Lord. Amen. I'm grateful that we can sing this song tonight. Amen. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife lifted up. Sing above. you glad Jesus saved this yeah. evening? What a great thing to know. Amen. Brother Trey, would you open us in a word of prayer this evening? Father, we come before you tonight. We're thankful for a great start right our missions conference tonight. We come together. We ask you to speak with us tonight. Would you fill us with your spirit? Will 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 you give us a heart into the fields that you present us tonight? And we just be in this service and help us to do it. Hear from you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And it's so good to see you. Uh, this evening. Glad you made it out on a Thursday night, second night. Anybody here tired? Got a few hands. Anybody here not tired at all? Got a few of you others. All right. That's great. And so, hey, and uh, we often say, hey, for those of you that are tired, this is not the time to take a nap. And uh, so, uh, we, hey, listen, we come to hear from the Lord. And if you fall asleep, you won't know if it's the Lord you heard from. Right? I heard a voice from heaven. And uh, it might have been the person sitting next to you saying, wake up. And uh, we're glad you are here tonight. And uh, good to be in the house of the Lord the second uh, night in a row. And, uh, you know, uh, can, can I say that we cannot be here too much? Amen. The scripture teaches even so much the more as you see that day approaching, right? Amen. And I appreciate you not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And I'm glad that you are here for this, uh, the second evening of our missions conference. And uh, if you haven't picked up a brochure, grab one of those brochures. And uh, if you haven't picked up a Faith Promise mission card, I want you to make sure to grab one of those. And uh, again, just as we told you last night, the purpose of our conference is to, to, to continue to give us the burden for souls. Right? And uh, Jesus does save, does he not? And uh, last week at this time, uh, sitting in Bible study in Fort Worth at my sister's job, 
And uh, for our church members, we know what I'm talking about. For those that are visiting, the Lord's opened up an opportunity for me to teach a Bible study at my sister's job in the west side of Fort Worth. And uh, they, uh, they got a Christian boss, and a uh, guy, guy uh, had somebody in from uh, a very, uh, you know, yes, and, uh, uh, you know, an evangelical there to, to teach Bible study. Well, things happened where he wasn't able to be there. My sister said, hey, my, my brother's a pastor. You may call him. And so I was supposed to just to fill in. About a year and a half later, I'm still teaching Bible study. And, and the interesting thing is I'm, I'm teaching the folks that are in some of these. Uh, the, the, the guy that owns the company, he told me, he said, our church, he said, my pastor will preach to 1,400 or 14,000, something like that, every Sunday. And he says, we don't get sermons like this. That's a shame. I'm not saying that hey, my sermons are so wonderful, but they ought to be learning something. Right, and uh, last Thursday we were sitting there, and uh, the the lesson presented itself a very strong gospel presentation, and and I made as often as we've done it, as, as often as the Lord allows, and uh, just a pre, uh, just a strong uh, uh, invitation to come and stay after. Hey, meet with us if you don't know for sure heaven's your home. Amen. And I had one of the men afterwards. Everybody was shaking hands and leaving, and one of the men was picking up chairs. He normally picks up chairs anyways, and I could tell there was something going on. And he walked up to me and he said. Um, about your question. I said, which question? He said, well, you, you said if I don't know for sure to stay after. I said, you have some questions about heaven being your home? He said, I do. And he began to weep. I said, let's come over here. Amen. Went through the gospel and showed him how to be saved. Amen. And Anthony trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And uh, it, it was a blessing. Since we were Thursday, the, this is Thursday, he's supposed to be there again this morning. We had an activity with our, with our guests. And so we scheduled our, our uh, Bible study this week for Tuesday. And uh, Tuesday I was there, and Anthony came up to me, and he says, he said, Brother, he said, I, I just want to say thank you again for last Thursday. He said, man. He said, I feel like a new man. He said, this is amazing. He said, I can't believe. He walked away doing this. I mean, just. <laughs> Jesus saves, does he not? And listen, I'm glad to know Jesus saves. Hey, he'll save in Fort Worth. He'll save in Sanger. Uh, he'll save all the way up in Lebanon, Missouri. Uh, he'll save in Forney, Texas. He'll save even in Oklahoma City. I mean, in Oklahoma City. I mean, my soul. And hey, listen, thank the Lord. Hey, Jesus saves anyone from the uttermost to the guttermost, right? And listen, this missions conference is to help remind us that he wants to save but how shall they call on him whom they've never heard? Right? How shall they believe if uh, on him if you've never? How shall they call on him if they've never believed? And how shall they believe if they've never heard? And, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And to our guests that are here, we're glad you're here. Hey, listen, we want to send folks out to send the gospel around the world. Amen. And I mean, listen, if it's one soul that repents, it's a shame that heaven would rejoice, but we would not over one. Over one. And listen, every one is so important. So I encourage you, hey, grab you a card if you haven't had it. And listen, sit down this week in prayer. Spend some time. And Lord, how, do I, how am I going to hold the rope in the area of missions? Uh, and and what, can I, what can I do? How can I participate in prayer? How can I participate in giving? How can I participate even in publishing here in my local area the good news of Jesus Christ and telling others about the Lord? And so let me encourage you to do that. But sure glad that you were here. And uh, it's good to have, of course, our guests that were here last night. It's also good to have the White family that's here with us uh, this evening. And uh, we, we got a chance to meet the Whites uh, in um, Red Oak, Texas. And uh, went out there for a Valentine's banquet, not really knowing all that was there. And, and they were there doing a remodel project for, uh, for a church. And uh, they just happened to be there. And when we, uh, the Lord burdened upon our hearts, the uh, Baptist builders, and contacted Brother Cher. And he says, yeah, I've got a family that can come. And uh, we had just met you, I think, a week, week prior. And uh, so we've got us in contact. And so we're glad to have them here with us tonight. And so y'all make sure to get by and uh, meet them. And uh, if you go to their table, they have Joseph, hold that hat up for a second. Uh, Brother White says you have some of these uh, non-OSHA certified uh, safety hats, and uh, you can grab you one of those. And so, uh, so Jackson, you got one too? All right. Hey, here, Jackson, put yours on. Joseph, put yours on. Y'all come stand up here in the middle, okay? And uh, this right here, neither one of these guys are Bob. <laughs> Amen. So 
I'm glad they're not the ones building, and, uh, but they can be the ones praying and building something for the cause of Christ, right? And so thank you guys. You're going to be seated. So uh, Brother White says if you'd like to pick up one of those, you can, uh, as well as on Brother Ball's table. We good to see Brother Ball's presentation last night. There's some keychains about the, the military free day away. They look like little dog tags, okay? They're, they're, they're mock dog tags. And uh, Brother uh, Ball says if you'd like to pick up one of those to, to carry around with you to remember to pray for that ministry, Please do so. Pick one of those up. And he says he's got about he's got about 12 left in the first 12. And once they're gone, they're gone. And uh, I'm joking. He didn't say that. He said he brought up, what did you say, 200 of them or something like that. And uh, so there's plenty there. But uh, let me encourage you. Hey, pick something up like that. These men have these things so you can remember to pray. And uh, Brother Anderson's got some tracks uh, over here on the table remind us about his church. He said, I, I don't need a gospel track. I know the gospel. Yeah, but can you be a visual reminder for you to pray for the, the work in, in Forney? And uh, let me just encourage you to do that. And so we appreciate uh, being by and going by their tables and, and uh, meeting our guests. Well, we're going to sing some more tonight. Hymn number 510. And this hymn is Whosoever Meeteth Me. Are you glad you're saved tonight? All right, six of you are. And uh, are you glad you're saved tonight? That's a little bit better. Let's try it one more time. Are you glad you're saved tonight? I'm trying to warm you up for the preaching. And uh, so, whosoever meeteth me, 510, grab your hymn. Amen. Hymn number 510. Whosoever meeteth me, lift it up to the Lord on that first verse. I am happy today, and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior said, whosoever will, may come with him to stay. just a bunch of select people, right? Aren't you glad for that? Praise the Lord. Lift it up on that second and then we'll let you shake hands. Oh my heart. Shake one of those hands and see.
lifted up on that last for C510. Oh, what wonderful love, oh, what grace divine. Oh, what wonderful love. seated this evening. Amen. Remember years ago I was uh, I had a um, customer when I had a lawn business that I was talking to and I was trying to witness to and uh, as I was witnessing to him uh, he said oh you're one of those and I said what one of those well, I, I don't know what you mean by what, what do you mean by one of those you're one of those that thinks anybody can get saved yeah. I said well Amen. Lord did say yeah oh yeah <laughs> I said, the Lord did say, for whosoever. He said, well, don't you know what whosoever means is whosoever God chose? I said, but if he meant that, he would have said that, wouldn't he? Right. Amen. I said, when he says, for God so loved the world, he says, well, no, that's just, that's just the elect in the world. I said, so God doesn't have a love for everyone when he says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance? You know, he tried to just go round and round and round and say, oh, that all only means those that would be saved. You know, if God meant that, he would have said that. Right. Whosoever meaneth me and it meaneth you, I mean, whosoever will may come. And listen, uh, when he says whosoever's thirsty, let him come. Amen. If you're lost, you're thirsty. Yep. Oh, wait, not you, though. We didn't pick you. What kind of a mindset is that? That's a mindset that where you wouldn't be investing in missions. That's a mindset you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't want to be participating in soul winning. That's a mindset where you wouldn't pray. That's a mindset I don't want to have. And so I'm glad whosoever meaneth me. I was talking to Brother Smith during the dinner, and he was telling us about uh, one of our missionaries, uh, Joel Haynes. He was out there with Brother Joel and uh, out there with Ryan Nez as well and Brother Barnett, two of our missionaries uh, on the Navajo Indian Reservation. But he said Brother Joel was uh, there in Pinon, and we know that in praying for the, the work going on in Pinon, and uh, a group of builders have uh, promised to come by and, uh, no, they already built this one, right? Uh, built a building for the church in Pinon. They said if you'll put the slab out, we'll do the rest. Or put the foundation. So they did the foundation, cost them about $3,000, and this team came out and built the building for them that'll seat about 120, you said? 120 people in Pinon. It cost them $3,000. Wow, amen. I, I wonder, yeah, three days they had the, the building up. I, I wonder to a church trying to get off the ground if something like that would be a help. I mean, Brother Sims, if you had a building that could seat people in classrooms, I mean, never mind, you don't want that. <laughs> uh, how many of us remember our building when we didn't have the modular building? Anybody remember having fellowship over here? And please don't spill anything on the carpet. Anybody remember the red cake that somebody dropped over here in this back corner? And uh, yeah, it happens, right? And you're like, ah, but that's all we had. Yeah. Then we remember how exciting we were, it was when we got a modular building. Remember when we first had our first food day in there? Brother Powell, you hadn't even cut the windows out of the sheetrock yet. There was just sheetrock hanging on the wall. We were remodeling it, and you know how exciting that was. And hey, we're gonna have more room. And when we finally set out tables and had room for sixty, how exciting that was. Now it's getting too small. That's exciting, isn't it? Amen. Hey, sure appreciate those that are investing into churches, not just in, in ways that, that we're familiar with, but the White family, they've given their lives to help churches to build, to remodel, to do things. You know the most expensive part of building and remodeling? Not the materials, but the labor. 
And so they give their time, their experience, their knowledge to build buildings. I wonder if that would help churches in America today. It would. And so we're glad to have them here with us. And Brother White's going to introduce himself. Brother White, if you'll introduce your family. And glad you all are here tonight and uh, look forward to seeing his presentation this evening. Thank you again for being here. Yes, sir. God bless you. Amen. You have to go ahead and let that down. Hopefully it won't hit me in the head, will it? No, sir. It'll get close. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Straight up. All right. We're good. It'll take just a second. Okay. Have your Bible tonight. Go ahead and turn to the book of Ezra real quick. Met a young man named Ezra tonight. Where's he at? Right there, I was giving him a hard time. I said, do you have a brother named Nehemiah? I said, you came first, and Nehemiah's next. He said he didn't, but Ezra tonight. Uh, I want to give you just a verse before I show the, the, the slides, and I'll go ahead and introduce my family so I don't get in too much trouble uh, as well. I have my wife, Leanne. Uh, it's a familiar name to a lot of you guys, right? <laughs> I found that out when we had this Valentine banquet, as Pastor said. Find some interesting stuff out about folks that you don't know before. Uh, long story short, we fill out these little cards about these little things. You're supposed to put something interesting about yourself that nobody would know, and you're trying to pick out. And so I thought it was, you know, I had a pretty good one. I, I, I delivered one of our children, my, my daughter here, Grace. I delivered her. We didn't make it to the hospital, so I put that on the card. And you know, the pastor's up there reading through, and he said somebody delivered their own child, and we both raised our hand and was like, wait a minute, who, I, I thought that was my card. And, and I found out he did, then I found out his wife's name was Lee. And then I found out he had six kids. I'm like, this is like crazy here that, that you know, the guy just put that together. Uh, but my wife's name is Leanne, we have six children. I'll start with the oldest is Isaac, uh, then David is next, then John and Joseph. And after four boys, you need grace. So a guy gave us number five. Uh, number of grace and she came in a, a miraculous way like I said she she couldn't wait to get to the hospital uh, and then now I've been trying to work on some new material that was a you know decent joke but now everything that comes in to help our ministry goes to charity and she's in the nursery she's four uh, over there just turned four so uh, but we are the white family we're the independent Baptist builders and what we do is is basically what he just described we go around the country we help churches with building projects uh, with remodeling just however we can be a blessing to those congregations. We'd have been blessed to be able to help some church planners and, and just the, the impact that makes on a church planner and their family. Usually it's them serving just their family. And to have a family come in and not only be able to do the physical work of turning a storefront into a church or converting whatever into a space to meet, but have a family there that's willing to serve and jump in. And uh, when you got six kids, you're in instant Sunday school class, so you can just make up. But, but you know how it is. I mean, when you have children and you have folks, then other folks want to come and be a part of that. So sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to find that first family that's going to be there and serve. So we can kind of can, can be that, not a fake family, but we're there serving, and then we can kind of pass the torch off as the facilities get done. And it's, it's a huge thing. It's, it's a big blessing for us to be able to do that. So Ezra, tonight, Chapter 4, I'm going to share a verse with you, then we'll show the slide presentation, uh, and then I'll share maybe a, a verse or two more. But Ezra, Chapter 4, Verse 24, uh, not, not a, a verse you would think of a lot and not a really good verse, I guess, but verse 24 of chapter 4 says, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And what had happened is all this opposition that was against this being built kind of took over. And, and, and it's a sad verse to me that, you know, it's all about building. It's all about wanting to serve the Lord, and they're trying to get the, the temple rebuilt. The old one had been destroyed, and, and the work ceased, and, and the people gave up. And just my encouragement, my, my heart is I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen in our churches in America. You know, we, if you look at our prayer card, we, we chose Revelation 3 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Not everybody's giving up, not everybody's letting the work cease. And we want to do our part as a family to. To keep that going and to be a blessing and to keep God's word going forward in the right way. Keep seeing people get saved. And that's what it's all about for us. So we'll go ahead and start uh, tonight this presentation. I probably had to get out the way so y'all could see here. I'm going to kind of just slip in the back here to be able to talk where y'all can't see the back of my head. Uh, this is my family. Like I said, I've already introduced these guys. But uh, this is our home church, Cloverleaf Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. 
Uh, we are United States missionaries. Uh, there's people dying and going to hell right here in the United States of America. They need the gospel. Uh, and our group is called Independent Baptist Builders. And these are men that are called out by God to use their construction talents and abilities for the Lord. Uh, this is Brother Paul Sharon there in the middle that, that he mentioned. He kind of heads up our group, does the scheduling. Uh, on the left side, you have Brother Robinson and his family. Then you have Brother Adams and his family. And there's also one other man that's not pictured. He'll be leaving the ministry this may to take a position as assistant pastor so we already have a need for help if uh if that so uh fits your desires if the lord's calling you to do that please see me uh tri-city baptist church millbrook alabama this church was burned down uh completely to the ground and had to be rebuilt so this is a process of that going back in uh, lighthouse baptist church theodore alabama we did a, a stage remodel there they're a growing church needed to add another step for the choir because it's a growing ministry uh, there's a hardwood going in on that and you can see the size of the, the auditorium there the congregation is just a, a great work to be part of this is a church planner uh, you can see kind of the storefront there chelsea baptist church and this is a week before easter about three years ago uh, this was us putting the finishing touches the, the tile going in we already had the walls up but uh, as far as i know this church had about three people say that first easter sunday by being part of this community so that made a difference to that man and to that congregation and to the to that community there to have that uh, this is harvest baptist church another church planner hillsborough texas it was an old frame shop we went in we were able to build the walls there's the auditorium there they've actually brother, brother graf was talking about exciting they've actually outgrown this space and are going on to another phase and actually have a whole nother auditorium that, that we renovated to to give them more room uh, christ gospel baptist church not a solga Alabama. Everybody said that real fast about 10 times. Uh, you don't have the, the marking on weird names out here in Texas, okay? Uh, but they needed a cover put on their church. Every time it would rain, obviously, it was just a hard situation to get in. They had a man in their church that was in a wheelchair, uh, served his country, been faithful. Couldn't go to church if it was raining. Obviously, it just took him a long time to get out of the vehicle. The Lord just worked it out. This was a Sunday evening, and Lord provided some rain that evening, but he was able to come to church, still be able to get there, and uh, just just nice to serve a veteran in that way. And it was, you know, for the church, but it was extra special to see that somebody that really benefited from this cover being there, uh, part of that. Calvary Baptist Church, you follow Oklahoma, a uh, ministry similar to, to the brothers here up on the right. Uh, they had a lot of food that is donated. They had it in different freezers all across the property just you know some stuff would go bad just trying to be good stewards of what god had given them so we built this huge deep freezer to be able to put stuff in and be better stewards of what they've uh, been given uh, we went inside there they have a lot of meetings every year uh, they do camp all these different things and i uh, needed to redo the cafeteria there to be able to better serve people so we built some walls redid some of the electric and the ceiling just made it a lot nicer for people to come in and out and be able to serve and and hear the gospel that's what the the whole problem uh, with what we do is uh, right here, uh, White River Baptist Church in St. Paul, Arkansas. Uh, again, I believe this church is using uh, his, his material now, but these are cabins for an addictions program. And uh, this pastor brought families onto the church property to get clean, to give their lives to Christ. And uh, part of that is getting them, if anybody knows where St. Paul, Arkansas is, it's in the middle of nowhere. And that's part of the design is it gets them out of that element, gets them away from those dealers, and nobody's coming up there and, you know, unless they are supposed to be there. So uh, this is just a great project they had a vision for. Crossroads Baptist Church in Annapolis, Indiana. This is not Alcatraz. This is actually a, a, a parsonage uh, on the church property. It had been sitting there for quite a while, needed to be renovated. We were able to go in, reframe the whole structure. Uh, and what this did, this allowed this church to bring on an assistant and bring on a youth pastor uh, to minister to young people and be a blessing there. It's having this as part of the package to, you know, they, they couldn't pay them a whole lot, but they had a house for them and, and those type things. So it made a huge impact on that church and that ministry to, to have somebody there that would be ministering to their young people. Uh, Talkeetna Baptist Church, Talkeetna, Alaska, uh, very neat project. Uh, basically, we doubled the size of the auditorium. The, the, the frame was already up. We came in, were able to all do all the sheetrock and finish it out. And, and just, a, just a growing church. It's kind of a, a tourist trap on the way to Mount Denali, but uh, every tourist trap has people. And there's people there that need a gospel. And it's great to see how God is just using that, multiplying that. Union Baptist Church, Brooklyn, New York. And 
first thing I say when I said New York, I was thinking that old Pace commercial, right? We're in New York City, and I'm from Alabama. You could tell I talk just like I talk now, but I talk there in New York. I got some looks. Uh, but you can see this building was built in 1863. Uh, some of the carnish, all the, the, the boards are just rotted, falling down. They actually condemned this building, wouldn't let them meet in it anymore, and, and they really wanted to tear it down and sell it uh, to make a good profit. But Lord stepped in. There was a couple pastors that got together. Uh, they, they raised some money at the Church Planners Conference a few years back at Heartland, were able to, to raise funds for the material. Uh, so this is what had to be done. The roof was in bad shape. Every time it rained, it would just come in the building and so we had to stop that water from coming in so this was uh this was my task is once the asbestos shingles came off we had to patch all these different spots on the roof that had holes and then put it back together and you can kind of see i'm i'm tied off here this is this is the reason i'm tied off is because this is my view it's about seven stories up uh so made it a little bit difficult to to work you had to i didn't tell my wife the, the view until we were done with this project pretty much uh but but I did make it home every day, so that was a blessing. Uh, so this is the new roof back on. They have these uh, copper snow guards. And, and being from Alabama again, I said, oh, what? What, what is that? I, I said, you show me how to put it on, we'll do it. But I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but these are the two towers, the backside of them that you saw from the front. Both of these towers are completely rotted out. We had to rebuild them. Uh, we had to have engineers come in and, and tell us how that uh, we were supposed to do it and different things like that. And you can see all this scaffolding that's up around there all, all, the, all the way around. That scaffolding was about $60,000. And they didn't buy it. That was just to rent it. I, I thought they were going to keep it at that price, but uh, apparently not. Uh, so this is the top of the towers after we had shirt up the inside and rebuilt them. They had to had to look like it looked in 1863. It had to be a historical thing. Uh, there was all these problems and uh, committees we had to jump through. And if you could see, uh, kind of in the, the background of that, that last picture was the Freedom Tower where the World Trade Centers uh, were at and, and just a view right there from the East River being uh, a guy from Alabama being in New York City and seeing that landscape right across. It, it was just an awesome view. Uh, an awesome place that God had just placed his church right in that community where it needed to be. Uh, being built in 1863, pigeons decided that they liked this building quite a bit, so I, I'm not going to say what that is, but you can use your imagination that uh, it, it was not fun to, to deal with some of that pigeon stuff. Uh, so this is a process of the towers being rebuilt, uh, all the cornice work going back on, being painted, uh, new roof on the top. Uh, again, you can see a little bit better picture there. The skyline has got the Empire State Building off to the right, the Freedom Tower. Uh, just an awesome project to be part of. And while we were there, the church we were staying at had a group of young men from college that devoted their summer to going out and ministering to the Jewish people, the community. They put all these packets together that had a DVD presentation and gospel tracts, all these things. They, they handed out about 90,000 of these during the summer. Uh, so here's a couple of our little ones getting involved and jumping in, making these packets up, putting everything together so uh, they could go out and minister. This is us soul win in New York City. Uh, totally different place. I mean, you walk up the street, and then you go about two blocks, and you turn around, you walk down the street, and you never see the same person twice. It's just amazing how many people that you come in contact with. So we're just trying to give the gospel out, be faithful witnesses where we're at. Uh, Forest Hills Baptist Church, Rockville, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, this is Brother J.J. Lusk. You can see they're meeting in a schoolhouse, and they had to tear this down every Sunday. So they would rent it for Sunday morning only, and it was costing them about $1,000 per Sunday to do that. So it was an amazing thing. I'll let him speak here for a second. Hi, I'm J.J. Lusk, church planner to Rockville, Maryland. My family and I moved here a couple of years back, and we're in our new space. Uh, we'll be moving in, Lord willing, in a couple of months, and one of the great blessings of having Brother CJ here is that what you see happening, what he's shown you, we would not be able to do financially uh, without families like uh, the Whites uh, to come and work alongside us. Uh, I was running some numbers just a minute ago just to see how much uh, he saved us in the time that he's been here. And in the three weeks that they've been working on this project, we've saved approximately $35,000 uh, or basically reduced the overall cost of this renovation by 25%, which as you can imagine, being a church plant is, is incredible. We really couldn't have done it without them. We appreciate the family, the spirit of the family, the hard work ethic of CJ, and uh, just the, the great attitude and blessing that he's been uh, to us over the past three weeks. 
Amen. Uh, this is another picture of that. This is Peak View Baptist Church, Florissant, Colorado. Uh, built a parsonage there. It was really neat to, to be involved in this project. It was right at the base of Pikes Peak. So, again, Lord's just good to those. If, if you just serve him with your talents, he, he can do things that you would just never imagine. Uh, Eagle Drive Baptist Church, Decatur, Texas, growing ministry, needed some, uh, some more space to have a place to do RU and to do children's ministry. Uh, this is Lighthouse Baptist Church, again, the same one we did the uh, stage remodel. We basically two-storied an existing gym, so we put a whole other floor in there, and uh, they use this bottom for Fellowship Hall and for a Korean ministry. Uh, this is pretty neat. We actually got to work at our home church. So we got to do our ministry and be part of our, our home church there for a while. We had a, a new pastor about a year and a half ago, wanted to do some update on the sound systems. We took a, a couple rooms, made it into a bigger room for our Sunday school area, and VBS, those type things, updated the outside of the building, new windows, uh, and all that was just to, to, to put a fresh look on everything, to get people in and make it inviting for people to be able to come and hear the gospel preach. And, uh, Grace Baptist Church Sims, same thing. This uh, building had been there for a while, redid the whole outside, put new siding on it, uh, redid the platform on the inside. There's my oldest Isaac getting involved, doing some work there as well. Uh, Hopewell Baptist Church, Turner Station, Kentucky. Again, one of those places that just it's not on the map partly at all. It's in between Louisville and uh, Cincinnati out in the middle of nowhere. And, and nobody wanted to come do this job. Nobody wanted to come help this brother out. And it was a big blessing for us to be able to come and do it. The building was built in 1819. Uh, no insulation, wood floor, just in a, in, a, in a bad shape. And this was some of the stuff that they were dealing with. They, they had done their best to try and keep it up and do what they could. But this is the before and this is the after. So you can imagine the big difference there that made to those people. Uh, just that community, we were, there was just a buzz around it uh, as we were there. Uh, this is a home we built for a missionary in Crowley, Texas last summer. Uh, this missionary's got cancer, terminal cancer. They've been on the field about 40 plus years, uh, seen many souls come to know Christ and church decided they were going to honor him by trying to build a house for him and his wife to, to come home and, and, and be with the Lord in. So uh, this is the process of that going up. This is kind of the in the stage of another one of my boys up there bringing me some water. I got hot summers in Texas. I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. He, he was trying to do my best to keep me hydrated there last summer. Uh, this is the kind of the finished product there as you step back. It's a blessing. Uh, Temple Baptist Church, New Iberia, Louisiana. This was the before. Uh, again, just dated building is, is in the 60s, you know, late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, just paneling on the wall. Ceilings are about 10 different heights. Just had a lot of VCT tile that had been coming up, just all these different things. So, again, that's the before. Uh, and this is kind of where I like to make the joy, joke, and I tell the pastor, this is during. I said, little brother, i got to leave. i got to go somewhere else. Uh, you know, and they kind of have that heart attack moment for a second. But. You know, this is dirty work. You know, you think of that verse in the Bible where it says, you know, where there are no ox is, the crib is clean, but much increased by strength of the ox. So this is what happens. You know, it's nice to look at the pretty finished product, uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into that. It's a new baptistry we put in in the back. Uh, again, I think that's Isaac there doing some painting on the facility. Then this is the after. Uh, so you could just tell just an amazing, amazing change there. Uh, great pastor, great guy. We hadn't been in this new facility Maybe the first week you already had some people saved and baptized. So guys are already using this in a mighty way. I'll let him tell about it. Hello, I'm Aaron Weedo, pastor of Temple Baptist Church in New Iberia, Louisiana. And I just want to uh, give you uh, the commendation of our brother CJ and Miss Leanne White and uh, their children. Uh, great blessing to our church here. Uh, they've been here uh, helping us, I believe now for about uh, two uh, to three months and, and just have been used of the Lord greatly uh, to do tens of thousands of dollars worth uh, of uh, labor and work and expertise in building and helping us to remodel uh, our auditorium and then also a, a space uh, in our upstairs gym building and, and uh, just have done so with uh, a great attitude and, and a servant of the Lord is a Christ-like spirit. I appreciate their children as well, Isaac and uh, David and John and uh, Joe and uh, of course the girls, uh, Grace and Charity. I appreciate them as well and just the way that they sing and are willing to serve in, in any capacity and uh, they really have blessed our church in uh, a very big way. And I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord has uh, given these uh, gifts and, and talents and abilities to the uh, white family to be able to use for God's glory and uh, 
just want to let you know that uh, anybody out there looking uh, to uh, have them come and help, uh, you would be uh, blessed of the Lord to have them at your church. Thank you very much. Lord bless you. Amen. And that's kind of gives the outline here why support us as missionary builders and kind of self-explanatory on the screen there that you know, most of the cost is the labor. If you'll go ahead, you can cut the lights on, brother. I just want to share one more verse real quick tonight, and, I, and I'll be through. Uh, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. And what that video did, that just gave you kind of a snapshot. That's what we did last week. Uh, you know, this, you know, that's over a couple years' worth of time, uh, obviously. It's not something we just, okay, you're a little slow from, from dinner. I get it. Uh, but, uh you know, what we do, kind of the ins and out of it, is we, we live in a fifth wheel. God blessed us this past summer. He gave us a fifth wheel, gave us a truck to pull the fifth wheel with. Just, I have time to go into all those huge blessings, but God's good. Uh, so what we do is we stay on site at the building project, and we're there on site. We're living on the property. We're there to be a blessing, to, to jump in, to teach, preach, sing, whatever God wants us to do while we're there. Uh, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, I just want to give you one verse, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up tonight. I just want you to be thinking... Tonight, I already mentioned that we've got a guy that's going to be leaving. There'll be a spot open, so to speak. But Exodus 4, 2, God's talking to Moses, and he said, The Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And, and, and this verse just really hit me between the eyes when I surrendered to do this ministry and to go into it and just think about, you know, I just want to ask you the same question tonight. What's in your hand? You know, what is it that God has given you? What talent do you have? What skill do you have? Maybe it's a computer mouse. Maybe it's a wrench. Maybe it's a hammer. Whatever. Whatever it is that's in your hand, give it over to God. You know, Moses did. He was faithful in that. It was just a tool. right? He was using it just to bonk the sheep on the head and get them in line. But when he gave God that rod, you think about when he parted the Red Sea. What, what did he hold up? It, it wasn't his anymore, right? It was what? The rod of what? The rod of God. And he just multiplied that beyond, I'm sure, Moses' even understanding. And he can do the same thing with whatever ability that you have that you'll place in his hand tonight. So I just pray that you'll do that. I just challenge you tonight to, to do what God wants you to do and, and give over what's in your hand. Brother Smith, are you? I do, I do want to make a couple mentions, a couple of things we saw in the presentation. The church in, uh, in New York, that's the first time any of you have seen a picture of that church, but we were at the church planner conference, and you're a church that gave to that work yeah. and enabled us to be a blessing to a church to take an old, worn-down building and restore it to a church. Uh, there was another church. Uh, there was... This, Ooh, I forgot which one it was now. Uh, Maryland, yes, thank you. And uh, Brother Lusk uh, in Maryland. That's another church planter that you as a church gave money to multiple years in a row to help them continue the work or start a work. And now we get to see someone who's done much of the physical labor for which you gave money to. And so, and then uh, Brother Weedo. Anybody remember Brother Weedo? Now, this Weedo, you may not know, that's the nephew of Brother J.D. Weedo, and Brother Aaron Weedo goes to camp with us. And some of you teenagers may say, that guy looks familiar, because he goes to camp with us. And, uh, and so somebody that, you know what, you know, we see that it's affected his ministry. And uh, so what a great opportunity to see that, you know what, as, as, as Baptist builders, we've actually been able to give to many of these churches. And then they say, well, we got this money. What do we do with it? We can buy materials. Oh, great, but we have materials, but no one to do the work. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And I sure appreciate the, uh, the White family. They're not just going to build. Uh, did you notice also? They're soul winners. Yeah. Going out to witness. And so reaching souls for the cause of Christ. So just wanted to make some of those, uh, cont or those you know, connections there for your church for you to be able to see that uh, you've actually impacted many of these ministries that the White family have been able to be a part of. And for that, we're grateful. Well, let's sing Man, let's stand together. One more hymn this evening, hymn number 106. Hymn 106. We're holding the rope while others throw out the lifeline. Hymn 3, 106. Throw out the lifeline. Let's look to the Lord on that first verse. Throw.
Somebody, we all know somebody who's not saved, right? Who hasn't hasn't accepted Jesus Christ. Think about them while we sing this last verse here, and our special we'll have in just a moment to lift up to the Lord. before our young people sing. We've got a few extras in here as well, I noticed. And uh, welcome. Hey. Hey, y'all join the church tonight too? <laughs> no, okay. And uh, <laughs> amen. And right before our young folks sing, you know, it sure is exciting to see what God does with the young people. Yeah. And uh, churches many, many times will they'll get to a point where they say, we don't want a missions conference. We don't want to talk about these things. You know, they bring up that money thing and people get kind of offended and then they don't want to show up. But you know, missions conferences across this nation, there's some young people that listen, and they listen to the voice of God speak to their heart. And God says unto them, I want you. It doesn't matter the title or the position, but I want you to surrender. And we're thankful for a bunch of young people here in our church. But imagine, if you will, for those of you that have been around here for a while, imagine if somebody, when God was calling, would have said no. I wonder who'd be up here today singing. If a family would have said no. Lord, I know you're calling, but I don't want to answer. What if others that gave that the work here might continue would have said no. You see, it doesn't just affect a small portion. It affects generations. Brother Smith many years ago said, Lord, Yes, I'll go. He and his wife knelt at an altar and surrendered to God's will and took what they had as a young couple and just surrendered to God's will. Many years later, God would work on their hearts and giving towards missions and and serving in any capacity he could. He would serve in evangelism. He would serve in the pastorate. And even after retiring after 24 years as pastor of Trinity Baptist Church, still saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's not just something we say to do. It's something that I'm glad that I've been able to meet men that have done it. Lord, here am I. Here am I. Send me. Brother Smith, we're glad to have you here with us again tonight. Look forward to hearing the next message you have for us. And church, let let me ask you, listen as God speaks to your heart. And you might just hear a higher call. (laughs)
Well, amen. That was a blessing, young people. God bless you. And I, the truth of that song, God has far much for each of us to do than we have been willing to do. God wants to bless us far greater than we're experiencing now if we just make ourselves available to Him and His will and His plan. Isn't it amazing how our plans get in the way of God's plan? And yet God didn't create us for us. He created us for Him. We were created to bring Him glory, to please Him. And uh, thank you, young people. That was a blessing. Open your Bible to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. Who's the pastor at Theodore, Alabama? Randy Toole. Okay. Thank you. 2 Kings chapter 7. If you found your place in 2 Kings chapter 7 and you're able to stand, out of love and respect for the Word of God, would you stand with me and follow me as I begin to read in verse number 3. The Bible says, And there were four lepers, leprous men, at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Now keep in mind there was a terrible famine in the land because the city was under siege by the, Assyrian, uh, by the Syrian army under Sennacherib. And people were dying. There was no food that was available. What little might be available, well, the price of it was unbelievable. And sir, that stuff you showed there in the New York deposited by the pigeons, they were selling that for food also. And uh, these lepers said, Why set we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall in unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, and the noise of horses, even the ho noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel had hired uh, against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled into the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, let, uh, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And we'll leave off reading there. And I want to use that story to challenge you with missions tonight. 
Notice verse number 9. After they had gone into the, the tents and they had eaten their fill and everything they needed was there and things they never dreamed of, gold and silver and raiment, they went and hid it and they were sitting outside with full stomachs, satisfied, and then one of them said, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. We found the answer to the problem. People are starving. They're buying what they can at exorbitant prices. The food was not available, and they found everything we need. And we're sitting here just enjoying it ourselves, and the city is starving to death. We do not well. And they said, if we don't go and tell them, some great mischief is going to fall on us. My, my, may we take that message tonight to heart. We've also found the mother load. We found the answer to man's problems. We found the answer to the sin curse on mankind. And we do not well when we do not go into the cities and share the glad tidings, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised again for our justification. Father, would you help me tonight as we look at this story and challenge these dear people to get involved in carrying the gospel, bearing the good tidings of Jesus Christ to a world that's starving to death, a world that's dying in spiritual famine. Lord, the devil's crowd's out there, but where's God's people? Thank you for these faithful missionaries that are here with us and those that are serving in parts of the world. And thank you for these dear children of God in this church and others like them across the world who's doing what they can to share the good tidings of Jesus Christ with a world that's dying and going to hell. Not because they shook their fist in the face of God and rejected you, but most of the world just don't know. And there's nobody willing to go and tell them. Speak to our hearts tonight. And I pray that someone here might say, Lord, here am I. Send me. And I pray that every child of God and every member of this church will pray and ask you, Lord, what would you have me to do about telling the good tidings of Jesus Christ to a world who's dying without hope? And we have the answer. Speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In our Bible story, uh, Syria was under siege by Sennacherib's Syrian army. The army had cut off all food and water from the uh, Samaritan city. The Syrian army was waiting for the people to starve to death or surrender. It seemed to be a hopeless situation. Four lepers were sitting outside the gate of the city and were about to starve to death also. One of those lepers said to the other, there's a terrible famine in the city and if we go in there, we'll die. And if we sit here, we're going to die. So let us go ahead and go into the host of the Syrian army. At worst, they'll just kill us. But at best, maybe they'll feed us and keep us alive. And these four lepers rose up early, the Bible said, in the morning at twilight time and made their way into the camp of the Syrians. And to their surprise, the camp was completely empty. During the night, the Lord had caused the Syrian army to hear the noises of chariots and horses. They thought it was the king 
that the king of Israel had hired the Hittite army and the Egyptian armies to attack the Syrian army while they slept. And I'm telling you, the entire Syrian army was so frightened by what they thought they had heard that they rose up early in the morning and fled for their lives. They left their livestock. They left their tents. They left their riches. They left their food and their water. And they'd run away so quickly that they had even left their clothing. They got out of there, brother. And God did it. God did it. People in town didn't know God had done that for them. They had no idea. But God had driven them away. Hey, I wonder how many things you're going to discover when you stand before God that God did for you miraculously that you didn't even know God did it. I wonder how many accidents God has saved you from that you didn't even know that you was about to have an accident. We have a great God. We have a great God. As these four lepers entered into the camp, they found no one there. And then they discovered all the water and the food and the stuff that the army had left. They left food, raiment, gold, silver, horses, cattle, and so forth. Everything they had. Brother, they just got up when they heard that noise, scared to death, and they moved on. They ran for their lives and left it all. And in verse, we're, verse 8, we're told that these lepers ate, and they drank, and they took the, uh, and hid the, the stuff for themselves, and they thought, man, we've struck it rich. Then they remembered the rest of the people back in the city. People who were starving. People who had no money to buy food if there was food to buy. They were thirsty. And they were dying. And in verse number 9, one of the lepers said to the other, We do not well. We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. We've got the message of hope and the message of life to save the starving people in that city. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will surely come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. What they were saying is, we're not being honest before God. They were saying, we found the answer and we have, told, we have uh, not told those in the city who need so desperately what we found. I want you to know we're the four lepers today. Majority of the world's without the gospel. The majority of the world has never shook their fist in the face of God and said, I reject you. The majority of the world has been duped by the devil. They believed his lie. They have no idea and no understanding of Jesus Christ and his death on Calvary as payment for their sin. They've never heard, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They have no idea. But we know. We found the answer. We've eaten of that heavenly gift. We are saved and we're satisfied. We're going to heaven. Amen. May God help us to wake up and be ashamed because we've discovered the glad tidings. We have the message the world needs. But we're not telling it. We're not sending those to go for us. We're not knocking doors and telling it in our cities. We're not sharing that good news with our families. We do not well. We do not well, the Bible says. 
Now, too often, we're those four lepers. Yeah, we've, we were hopelessly lost in our sin, doomed to hell and without hope until God with his miracle of grace has provided for our salvation through Jesus Christ. Now we have the good news. We have the glad tidings of eternal salvation free through Jesus Christ. No one has to die in their lost uh, sins lost and go to hell. Salvation is free. It's finished. It's for whosoever shall call upon Jesus Christ. We, what, we have what every lost sinner needs. We have the truth about eternal salvation. Amen. And we do not well if we do not run into the cities and to the people, even to the uttermost part of the earth, as Jesus said to tell them this wonderful salvation story. We're commanded to tell them. Again and again, we're commanded to tell them. And if we're not telling it here in Sanger, Texas, in our hometown where we live, and we're not telling it around the world, we do not well. Amen. We do not well. Too often Christians are like these four lepers. We've entered into the salvation camp and now are too busy claiming the blessings and hiding our treasures while the rest of the world is dying without Jesus Christ. The Christian crowd and the local church today are too silent while the devil's crowd broadcasts their poisonous message everywhere the abortion crowd screaming their message, the homosexual crowd rights for recognition, the liquor crowd broadcast their position and advertising everywhere. The pornography, pornography crowd publishes their filth. The cult crowd marches with their lies, but the Christian crowd seems to be ashamed to tell others about the love of God that has provided a Savior for lost sinners. Many are guilty of the sin of not sharing the life-changing, soul-saving message of Jesus Christ. And you listen to me tonight. Those who have never heard are far more eager to receive the gospel when it's presented to them than we who have been born again are to tell them. Amen. We do not well. Now consider the following thoughts in light of the story and how it applies to every one of us who are saved. Not to give out the gospel to the lost world is sin of the worst sort. Someone said, well, you ought not categorize sin. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior while the rest of the world is going to hell and you do nothing to tell them or send the gospel to them, we are committing the sin, sin of the worst sort. It is first of all sin against the heart of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, yes, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. It is sin against the gospel of Christ, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It must be told to the world. Amen. There's no one responsible to tell the gospel story except those of us who have received it. God has no plan other than we who are saved tell that story to those that are not saved. That's not plan A and then there's a plan B and a plan C. No, just one plan. He didn't tell colleges to tell it. He didn't tell governments to tell it. 
but he told individual Christians in local churches just like this one to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you understand why it's, we're to preach the gospel? The gospel is that good news message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for a sinner's salvation. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible tells us that God has given to every man a measure of faith. You see, God created man differently than he created anything else, any other living thing on this earth. Everything on this earth he created for man but God created man for himself. And he created man, in man, a desire to worship. And God's plan was that we worship him. But sin messed all of that up in us. And our thinking's all messed up. But still, he's put in us that, that desire to worship something. And if they don't hear the gospel... They'll end up worshiping the sun or the moon or a totem pole or an alligator or a crocodile or Allah or somebody else or something, some fat pot-bellied statue sitting with his legs crossed. Man's going to worship something because God made us that way and God put a measure of faith, but that faith is dead and inactive in man until they hear the gospel. The gospel is what activates that faith. And I can't tell you how many times I've personally witnessed to a lost sinner and they all of a sudden say, I see. I, I've never understood it before. I've never seen it before. It's the gospel. It's not my great presentation. It's not your great presentation. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what causes men to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. When we preach the gospel and, and they're, they're, that faith is activated, the Holy Spirit can do His work in their heart and they can be quickened and made alive by faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, my soul. That's all been done, and it's available. And you know what? We found it. Amen. We've discovered it. Amen. And what we've done is we've hid it. That's right. And we're keeping it for ourselves. Yeah. When the world is dying and starving, and because we're not doing our best to go, and we're not doing our best to give, some of Satan's crowd comes along and presents their false gospel and they just suck it up. Yes, sir. We do not well. Amen. We do not well. Oh, my. There's no one responsible to tell that wonderful story but me and you. Not to tell the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection that provides free salvation for sinners is to rob them of the opportunity to be saved. Well, bless God, if they want to get saved, let them get saved the way I got saved. I've heard people say that to me. And I'm always quick to say to them, you didn't find Jesus by yourself. Somebody told you. And God intends for you to tell somebody. Somebody in that generation told your generation and now God expects you to tell the next generation. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. Are you telling it? How are you telling it? Well, every now and then I give out a track. Well, thank God for a gospel track. That's better than nothing, but your witness is better than the gospel track. You can give them the gospel track after you've witnessed to them and it just keeps on preaching to them what you've told them. The natural man understandeth not the things of God for they are spiritually discerned. That means the unsaved man does not have the Holy Spirit teacher in them to explain the scripture and how to get saved. That's the reason God tells us to go and tell them because the one who is the great teacher lives in us. Amen. God, the Holy Spirit. 
And he makes it possible, possible for us to witness. Amen. And he does his work when we do. If people could get saved just by reading a piece of paper and everybody got saved by just reading a piece of paper, then print it and just airdrop it all over the world so everybody could have a tub of it. But that's not how people get saved. They get saved when the missionary, the preacher, the Christian, the soul winner tells them about Jesus Christ, gives them the gospel of Christ. And that's why we're here, not just to go here in Sanger, Texas, but to make sure at the same time we're going, we're sending others around the world to tell the story of Jesus Christ. And if we're not doing our best, we do not well. We do not well. Here's what we do. I believe I can spare $3 this week. Or maybe I've got 20 I can give this week. That's not faith giving. Faith giving is asking God what he'd have you to do. Give it and trust God to give it back to you. I heard preachers one time say, well, faith giving is making a promise to God, and if he gives it to you, give it. That's not faith giving. That's sight giving. If you only give it after God gave it to you, that's not faith giving. Jesus said, you give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For the same measure you meet, or with you give, the same measure you give, with all, it shall be measured to you again. I've told you before, I'm going to tell you again. I have people all the time say, well, Brother Smith, you don't understand. I'm on a fixed income. If your income is fixed, you fixed it. God didn't. Yeah. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. How you give determines how God's going to give back to you. Your giving is going to determine your blessings from God this next year. How you give. I'm telling you, it is exciting to get into God's program and just watch him. Keep his promise. Hey, one thing God cannot do and be God, he cannot lie. And he said, if you give, talking to Christians, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Now, he said it'll be given in good measure, pressed down, second to gather, and running over. And the same measure that you give with all, it shall be measured to you again. What that means is simply this. Use a thimble to measure your giving to God. God said, you've chosen the measure. I'll use that same thimble to give back to you, but it'll be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Use a water bucket to measure your giving back to God. And he said, I'll use that same water bucket but it'll be given to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. He said, you choose the measure. How about a wash tub? <laughs> or a dump truck? <laughs> or a box car? Amen. God didn't put any limit on it. Right. He said, the same measure you give, with all it shall be measured to you again. But he said, it'll be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That means you're always going to get back more than you give to God. It's amazing. It's amazing how God gives back, how God provides. Mrs. Smith and I have given our tithes and offerings to our church faithfully since before I surrendered to preach. We've given to Faith Promise Mission since 19... 1969, that's when we were introduced to it. And we've watched God just bless us and bless us and grow us and grow us and bless us and bless us. If you knew what we gave, you wouldn't believe it. And God just keeps giving back and give it back. Well, after after I retired from pastoring, 
I don't get to be at our church every time the doors are open because I'm all over America. But every, we have at least a missionary a month come in other than, than the missions conference, sometimes two a month. My wife and I promised God if he'd help us, even though the church gives them a love offering and takes good care of them, we're going to give them something out of our own pocket, just to help them with food or gas or something. I have three grandchildren that are missionaries. and I, I, I just believe if I can help these alone, perhaps my kids out there can be helped alone by somebody else. Amen. And so we, we'll give them 50 or $100. And I come to my wife and I say, look what somebody gave us today. And it's always more than I gave. Amen. Hey, I'm telling you folks, Amen. if you're struggling, it's because you're struggling with a giving problem. Amen. If you're a Christian and you're struggling financially, you're struggling with this matter of obeying God in the matter of giving. Yes, Tithing and giving. Tithing and, oh, preacher, I give my tithe because I don't want to be under that curse in Malachi 3. You hadn't read that clearly. The curse was because they didn't give their tithe and offerings. And offerings. I'm simply saying to you, not to give out the gospel message is sin against God. It's sin against the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's sin against the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us and fills us with his power. And the number one responsibility of the power of the Holy Spirit in us is that we might be witnesses of him to a lost world. Last words Jesus spoke before he stepped on that taxi cloud that took him up to glory was, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And that both means here at home and all these other places at the same time and you can't do that without being a soul winning witness here and you give to send the gospel where you cannot go. That's God's plan. God's plan. The first and foremost reason we're filled with the Holy Spirit is that we, it's not so we can say, whoop, I'm a super Christian, I'm filled with the Spirit. Hey, a Spirit filled Christian doesn't run around bragging about it. They run around bragging on Jesus and free salvation that's available to a lost world. Not to tell the wonderful good news message is to sin against those who need it most of all. The lost sinner for whom Christ suffered and bled and died. Not to go and tell this wonderful story of sin against God himself who's told every Christian and every church member to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then not to go and give out the gospel to the lost world is to lose God's blessings, God's presence, and God's power on your life. Yes, sir. God don't give us the power of the Holy Spirit in us in order, as I said, we might go around and brag about it and say, I'm a super Christian. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Even the four lepers knew it was wrong not to share their great discovery. They said, some mischief shall come upon us. When Christ gives us the great commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he gives us the authority to go, the command to go, the power to go, and the promise of his presence as we go. Amen. Notice, he said, and lo, I am with you always. But listen, I've heard Christians claim that, why the Bible says, he, lo, I am with you always, but they don't read the rest of it. Hey, 
He tells us to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature, baptizing the converts. And then he said, Lo, I am with you always. If you're not going, you can't claim the low. They go together. No go, no low. One, sure, one of the sure ways of living your life without God's help, God's power, and God's promise is to ignore your part in the great commission of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me how you can get along in this wicked world without God's blessings, God's pleasant presence, and God's power. You see, I know without Him, we're helpless. We can do nothing. And then lastly... I want you to consider what happens when God's children obey God and make it possible for that wonderful story of Jesus and what He's done for sinners to be shared around the world. Sharing it ourselves and giving so others can go. What happens? Well, remember the maniac of Gadara? Huh? Remember that old boy? Lived in the tombs, demon-possessed, Wore no clothes. Sounds like the average Baptist I see today. They tried to chain him and he'd break the chains. No man could tame him. And then one day Jesus comes to the shore in a little boat, walks up on that shore, and the maniac comes running to Jesus. Unlike a lot of Baptists today, Jesus didn't say, hey, you're nuts. I don't have any time for you. He took time for him. Cast the demons out. They went into a herd of swine, and the swine ran over the cliff and committed suicide. The next time we see this maniac, he's fully dressed, in his right mind and he wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, go back to your own city, a city called Decapolis, an area of ten cities, and tell them what I've done for you. You go ahead and study the scripture and you'll find when the gospel came to Decapolis, there's people there waiting to receive the message. I wonder how they heard. I think the old maniac of Gadara went back and told him. Maybe he didn't have all the theology just right, but he knew what happened to him. And when Jesus came, they wanted what happened to them. Him happened to them. Hey, how about the woman at the well? Been married five times and living without marriage with a man now. Shacking up with him. Yep. Hey, by the way, well, we're living together. God understands. He didn't understand with this woman. Yeah. Right. He made a distinction between legal marriage and living together without marriage. Right. Yes, sir. She got saved. And she was so excited... Though she came to the well with her water pot, she left her water pot, ran back into the city, and told a great number of people in that city about Jesus. And a great part of that city accepted Christ because of the saying of the woman. Oh, if we'd just tell what God has told us, shared with us, what He has done for us, if we'd make it possible for the world I don't, no, not everybody's going to get saved. You and I both know that. But I'm here to tell you if we send the gospel, a great number will. A great number will. But if we continue on like we are, we're losing ground. We're further behind in evangelizing the world today than the day Jesus gave the Great Commission because of the population explosion. And the fact that we found the answer, we've taken and hidden it, we're keeping it to ourselves, and we do not 
well. How about the story of the lame man at the gate beautiful? Remember Peter and John on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer to pray? And here was a lame man sitting there at the gate, gate beautiful. And Peter and John, those Baptist preachers going to prayer meeting, walked by and he said, alms, alms. And they stopped and Peter said, silver and gold, have we none? I told you they were Baptist preachers. <laughs> Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give I unto thee. That old man was healed and he was saved and unlike us, he was excited about it. He began to run and jump and praise God and the crowds begin to gather and people begin to come to that place because of the excitement of one man that got saved and was telling that wonderful story. I can hear old Peter say to John, look at that crowd. I believe I'm going to have to say a few words. And you read it, he preached a simple message on the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus. How many got saved? How many got saved at that time? Wasn't it 5,000? 5,000? Hey, what will happen? You're thinking big, son. <laughs> hey, wasn't it, wasn't it wonderful what happened? Have you ever thought what might happen? if you got excited about what Amen. Jesus did for you? Yes, sir. If you didn't take it and just keep it to yourself and hide it and act like it's just for me only? The greatest gift, the greatest treasure that's ever been discovered. Money can't buy it. Gold and silver can't buy it. The riches of the world can't buy it. But it's provided free by God for whosoever Amen. shall believe upon him. We have that wonderful truth. We've experienced it. But what are we doing to tell others? And I'm here to tell you, if you're not being a witness in your city, if you're not giving so these who are called can go where we cannot go, we do not well. We, need to, we do not well. And we need to think like these old beggars, these lepers, who said, if we don't share this, some mischief's going to fall on us. And I'm here to tell you, we're going to have to stand before God one day, and we're not going to like it when we try to explain how we lived our life with the wonderful story of Jesus, and we didn't do our best to tell others and send that message around the world. Instead of God saying, you did not well, I want him to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Nobody can make that decision for me but me. I can't make it for you. Only you can. And may God move in our hearts to determine, hey, the world's dying and we have the answer. Let's go and tell them. Amen. And that's what this conference is about. Yes, sir. To give you an opportunity to get involved in a program through your church to carry the gospel in all those places you and I cannot go. Are you involved? Are you willing to ask God what he'd have you to do for world missions through your church. You're not going to know what to do if you don't fall on your face before God and say, God, what will thou have me to do? The first man I know that prayed that in the Bible was Saul when he got saved. I think old Saul prayed that prayer and I think from that day on, he began to live by the what wilt thou have me to do principle. Amen. And you know what the Bible says about Paul? He turned the world upside down. Yes, May God help us.
to not be content doing what we're doing or as little as we can get by with. But God, what would you have me to do? And then willingly do it by faith. You say, but I don't understand how I'm going to be able to do it. If you understand and know how to do it, without God, it's not faith. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Trust Him. Amen. And then hold on because you're about to begin the most exciting journey of your life. Amen. Obeying God by faith. And watching God do for you what you could never do for yourself. I'll be 80 in July. I've been preaching full time in the ministry for 55 years. I have never called, and I spent 10 years in evangelism before I went to Trinity to pastor. And now that I retired in 2010, I've been preaching everywhere. I've never called a preacher and asked him to have me. Now, I'm not against it. Missionaries have got to get out and do that. But I, I, I'm not the, the missionary going to the foreign field. I promised God if he'd be my booking agent, I'd go where he wanted me to go. I would never go on the basis of money. I'd go to any independent, Bible-believing Baptist church regardless of size, if he'd be my booking agent. I still have never called a preacher and asked him to have me. I've never written a letter and asked them to have me. And God just keeps opening doors and opening doors and opening doors. He's a lot bigger God than you make him to be. And he'd do a lot more for you if you'd be willing to yield yourself to him and obey him as he reveals his will for your life. But too often, we find ourselves having found the right stuff and we hide it in our tent. And in so doing, we do not well. Father, that's our message tonight. Speak to our hearts how we need you, how we need you. I pray, Father, for the dear people of this church trying to reach a goal and do more than they've ever done for world missions. And yet they can't do it without you. They need your direction. They need to know your will. They need to learn to step out by faith and trust you. We should never be afraid, Lord, to ask you, what will thou have me to do? And then obey you. Help us to get past this thing that you're trying to hurt us. No, you're trying to bless us. You're trying to help us. You're trying to get us into that place where you can do far above and beyond anything we've ever thought or dreamed or imagined in our life. And I pray these dear folks, as we begin this invitation, would seek you asking, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Knowing that if we do nothing, knowing we have the truth, we do not well in the sight of God. Speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Piano began to play.